Now we'll go through interesting discussions uh, from uh, four interesting books. The first one of them is How to Read the Old Testament by Charpentier and it comes as one of this group of how to and they are all from the uh, SPCK or from that publisher and they are by Catholic scholars. This book, very interestingly, I'd like you to, to pose and to write to read here because it tries to explain that what has been written in the Old Testament, it's actually the Jewish people going back to their uh, verbal traditional history when they started to write the Old Testament because most of it, uh, apart from parts written by Moses in the Pentateuch, the first five uh, books, but most of what was written was written when they settled not being a nomadic people going as tribes in the desert, but they settled and made a nation from the time of King David onwards. And it gives you some idea about the uh, arrangement in history of the different prophets and what they said and did. And in that book, I read the words of the true and exact and true, but not exact. And they put it in a very nice way, saying... Uh, Try to imagine that a young man uh, who was a motorbiker, uh, very adventurous, got into an accident, broke lots of bones, went into hospital, got treated in six months or so. During that time, he got better. He loved the nurse. They got married. And a year later, he's sitting down to recite his own experience of the previous year. So he will write things that are not scientifically accurate, but they are poetic. They are poetry. Things like, oh my dear love, if it wasn't for God who crushed my bones so that I can come to you and meet you and we love one another and start this beautiful love story and get married together, how lovely it was this year and so on. What is this man saying here? He's speaking the truth, yes, but he's speaking poetry. It is not exact in a scientific science or a scientific manner, but he's giving us his experience and that's how the Old Testament and how some parts of the Bible were written. It's the human experience of God's love to us and us together, our good, bad and ugly activities. We are putting them all together so that we can learn from them through our human experience, how we understand the love of God and his inspiration to us and his revelation to us and how we understand how to deal with one another. So it's, it's truth, but in a poetic human experience reflection. I like the words that there is no text, but there are always pretexts. When you take the pretext and you live it, it becomes a living text. So all what is written in the Bible is a finger pointing to God. When you, if I ask you, what is that? And I'm pointing to the moon as one of the uh, old Greek philosophers did. And then his disciples said, that is a finger. That's all what he managed to see. He couldn't see the moon or the actual thing that the philosopher was pointing to. Also, the holy book and all holy scriptures, they are pointers to God. God is the only absolute reality and our relationship with him is really what makes our life meaningful and what matters. If you stop at the finger and say that is a finger and you can't see what it is pointing to, you've missed the whole point, you've missed the whole message. So the Bible is the story of God and man through the culture and history, and that's what we call the frame of the box, like a treasure. St. Paul puts it nicely, he says, we have a treasure which is God in us, and we are the earthen vessels, we are the box that holds the treasure. Yes, the box is important, but what is most important is the treasure. Now, the Bible is like a box or like a frame containing a very expensive painting in it. It, it's, it's the reality of that very expensive pa painting which we are trying to pass through the generations. But it came to us in an old frame. What we need to do now is the old frame was a mythological frame about the story of Adam and Eve and the flood and so on. What we need to do is to undo the frame, put the new frame of our time, the language and culture of our time, but present the actual very expensive precious painting, the real treasure inside the box, so to speak. 
And this is a very difficult exercise for theologians and for Christian believers. It is far easier to take things literal and say, don't give me the headache of trying to work out where is the frame and where is the value inside the frame or where is the box and where is the treasure. The whole thing is just a treasure and the whole thing is literally so precious. No, the frame is not the language and the culture may contain things that are imperfect. When David speaks of uh, take the heads of the children of my enemies and hit them on the rock and crush them and crush my enemies and you God must be my uh, ally so you must hate my enemies. That's human feelings. It is not the feelings of God himself. Even very true that we see that when Christ was talking about divorce he said Moses because of the 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 your thick minds, that's the way, or your thick hearts and heavy hearts or unkind hearts allowed you to divorce. But it was not like this from the beginning. In my mind as God, it was a one man for one woman. They cleave together, they become one body and one person. And these two persons united together in that unity of the one body, of the one family. That is what I had in mind. So, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts or the thickness of your minds or the uh, retarded culture and ability to understand, he allowed you to divorce, but it is not so. So, what is he saying here? That not all what is written in the Old Testament is absolute perfection expressing God. That's why also St. Paul said, God spoke in different ways to our fathers through the prophets, but now he spoke to us in Jesus Christ, his Son the image of God and the actual icon of him. Uh, he, he is the essence of God described in us through an incarnated word of God into a human being. So everything that Jesus said, yes, was absolute. But there are also words that need to be interpreted when he said that I and the Father are one. Good, we understand this, but although we don't understand the mode of this oneness. But then he says, my Father is greater than me. Oh, uh, but I and the Father are one. How can you link these two statements together? Well, you have to understand the context of the discussion so you understand what he is saying. Otherwise, you misunderstand it. I came to give a sword, not peace. Oh, here you are. Critics of the Bible says, you see, Christ was also for violence. Here you are. They can't understand that he's talking spiritually and metaphorically about the sword being the truth that separates good from bad. But they take it as a piece of metal. Here you are. Literalism is actually not as glorifying to God as the depth of the symbolism and the spiritual meaning that we have in the Bible. Another book that we will look through as well is this one, How to Read the World, Creation and Evolution, and again by the same uh, Catholic scholars, and they are telling us that we can very easily understand that God created through the method of evolution. There is no contradiction. A third book which sums up much of that, it's in Arabic, but I'll tell you the content in English because it's wonderful and excellent to understand how we read the story of Adam and Eve. That's the title, actually. How do we understand today the story of Adam and Eve? That's a very precious book for the ones who can read Arabic. Then we will come to the book of Reason and Faith, which tries to tell us if we take the story of Adam and Eve literally, we're going to have lots of questions like, was there really a snake that was talking? Was it really eating dust? Was this really a fruit that if you eat, you die? And what does it mean to die if they didn't see death beforehand in the animal or plant kingdom? We'll come to this at the end. So let's take them uh, step by step and go through it and see what these books tell us because they are so precious to us and they open our minds. What I want you to understand here is what I'm telling you is a collection of my 40 years of research since I was a teenager reading about these points because they've engaged and uh, filled my mind with lots of questions and I wanted to understand them and I was very happy to read the writer Costa Bandelli who's a Lebanese Orthodox. These, as you can see, as Protestant uh, scholars, scientists and these two are Roman Catholic uh, groups of scholars talking together and that would tell us how to try to approach and understand symbolism and how to try to understand that what is in the Bible is true but not exact in some parts of it and true and exact in other parts and it's our very difficult task to try to discern this from that so we present something real to our kids rather than them coming to say oh well if I have to believe in science I have not to believe in God and if I believe in God I have to disregard science and they are in that schizophrenic 
situation. I want them to be helped and not to be left in this sort of dilemma.